Asia's on track for reducing income poverty. In fact, it's uh, the champion of getting income poverty down. But when it comes to uh, the health outcomes, to undernutrition, and to sanitation and other aspects of the environment, Asia's not fully on track yet. It hasn't turned this wondrous growth machine uh, into the other two bottom lines, the social bottom line and the environmental bottom line. We have to understand we're in a new world where GNP is not enough. We are in a triple bottom line world where we need income progress, we need social progress, meaning health and education and nutrition, and we need environmental sustainability. It's the triple bottom line that we have to judge the performance of our economies. Uh, Asia's doing super on the economic side. Uh, it's starting to make investments uh, in the social uh, and in the environmental side that are closer to being on par with, uh, with its uh, economic progress, but it needs to do more. Is it possible to actually uncouple, decouple uh, an entire economy from carbon consumption? The whole world needs to move to a decarbonized economy for a simple reason. If we continue to use carbon through fossil fuels and deforestation the way we are right now, we will wreck the climate and we will wreck the oceans. Because even apart from the climate change, the carbon dioxide in the air is making the oceans more acidic and that will destroy the marine ecosystems. We don't have a choice. We have to do this decoupling. Fortunately, things like solar power are so amply available. Thousands of more uh, amount of power and solar radiation than we use uh, in our societies, but we need to tap it effectively. Solar power, wind power, responsible use of biomass. Uh, and uh, responsible uh, use of other primary energy sources, geothermal energy and, and others. All of this has to become part of the mix. You actually just came back from Nigeria. You're very involved, of course, in Africa. Um, uh, what, what is really the potential of Africa with regard to new sources of perhaps labor or natural resources? I mean, they call Africa uh, the sleeping giant, but will it ever wake up? Of course, it was once uh, thought that Asia was uh, forever going to be somnolent and, and, uh, and uh, impoverished, and Asia definitely woke up and became the center of the world economic growth. Africa needs to do the same, can do the same. Africa's growth right now is not at Asian levels, but it's rising. Africa's growth is now at about 6% per year. It's really the best since independence a half a century ago. Asia's success is translating into African economic growth. So we're seeing a kind of reconstituting of Indian Ocean trade, I call it, uh, linking East Asia, South Asia, East Africa, and actually West Africa as well. Uh, Asia, uh, Africa has uh, lots of natural resources, it's got great agricultural potential, it's got a lot of poverty. It needs to uh, start uh, speeding up, which it's doing, but there's a lot of fragility. Uh, one should understand also Africa will definitely play uh, a larger role in the world simply by the fact of demography. The share of Africa in the world's total population and in the world's economy will grow. Uh, and Asia's first to recognize that in a serious way, I would say, because there's lots of Asian investment going into Africa right now. That's what's giving Africa a lift. I think Africa could make a takeoff out of poverty. But when you talk about fragility of the natural environment, you got to rank Africa way up there. Uh, heat stress, drought vulnerability, uh, loss of vital habitat. Uh, Africa faces all of those big challenges. And, and lastly, since we're in Indonesia, uh, you, you've written a paper, The Curse of Natural Resources. <laughs> Here we are, Indonesia a country full of natural resources. I think you are fairly bullish on Indonesia, uh, but this country is also exporting iron ore and bauxite, which is turned into metals and aluminum in China. It exports uh, rubber, which is turned into, into tires in Korea, or gas and oil, which is processed in Singapore and Malaysia, and then re-imported. Um, how, how can this country deal most effectively, uh, you think, with its natural resources and the diversification process? 
20 years ago, I studied this resource curse phenomenon, which is a paradox because uh, natural resource wealth should bring other kinds of wealth, but sometimes it brings disaster. Uh, and it looks pretty clearly that politics is a, a major part of that paradox, uh, that uh, natural resources are too easy to steal, uh, too easy to grab the rents, sometimes even create civil war uh, as you fight for who really owns that diamond mine or who really owns that uh, oil well. So it's the proper governance of natural resources, uh, re realizing that they're depletable, realizing that the goal is to convert the resource wealth into human wealth, into, uh, into infrastructure, into knowledge, uh, that that's the real uh, strategy uh, involved. It's transparency uh, so that uh, it's not a political game of lobbies, but actually a proper uh, democratic governance uh, of the nation's, uh, the, the nation's uh, resources uh, that's at stake. Uh, as long as there's a public awareness that this is the nation's patrimony, it shouldn't be stolen by some foreign investor. It shouldn't be stolen by some narrow political clique. But it should be used effectively on behalf of the whole nation. And accountability, foresight, planning, and a good uh, ethical commitment that these resources are for the nation's well-being, putting that together can overcome the resource curse.